Hello, I am Cynthia Baldwin, Vice Chair of the Fulbright Association Board, an honorary member of the Greater Pittsburgh Chapter Advisory Board. 17 years after the inception of the Fulbright program, I was a Fulbright scholar teaching constitutional law at the University of Zimbabwe Law Faculty. I am privileged to moderate this plenary session panel celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program. Wow, three quarters of a century, 75 years, 900 months, 27,375 days, 657,450 hours. Well, you get the idea. The Fulbright program has been around for a long time and it is still strong and it is still growing. During this conference, we are not only celebrating our past, but also where we are and where we are going. More than ever, our vision is a world where international exchange is widely recognized as a force for peace. We have a stellar panel to take us on this journey. Presenting the past is Lonnie Johnson. Lonnie has worked in international education for every over 40 years and served as the executive director of the Austrian Fulbright Commission from 1997 until his retirement in 2019. Those of you who have had the pleasure of talking with Lonnie know that he is a walking history book about the Fulbright program and is writing a book with the working title, Remembering and Forgetting Fulbright, The Remarkable History of the Fulbright Program, 1946 to 1971. Talking about the present is Terry Moulsa, the CEO of the Fulbright Finland Foundation in Helsinki. Knowledgeable in eight languages, she has 35 years of professional experience in higher education, internationalization, and exchanges, as well as consulting, training, and developing curricula in international education leadership. Giving us a glimpse into the future is Jay Wang. Jay is the director of the Center on Public Diplomacy an associate professor at the Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. Widely published on the role of communication in the contemporary process of globalization, he serves on the editorial board of the International Journal of Communication. Please post your questions in chat and we will answer as many of them as possible after the presentation. Without further delay, I turn the mic over to Lonnie. Um, hi, my, my name is Lonnie Johnson. I have uh, pre-recorded my marks and uh, shared them with the Fulbright Association and would be glad to comment them on them uh, after, after, they, uh, after they play them. So I'm going to uh, mute and go off screen again and ask the association uh, to roll those pre-recorded remarks. This is Senator J. William Fulbright from Arkansas, the congressional sponsor of the Fulbright Act of 1946 and co-sponsor of the Fulbright-Hayes Act of 1961. This year marks the 75th and 60th anniversaries of these landmark pieces of legislation. Born in 1905, Fulbright grew up in Fayetteville in Northwest Arkansas and graduated from the University of Arkansas in 1924. Then he spent three years as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and returned to the United States to study law at George Washington University. In 1943, he was elected to the House of Representatives and in 1945, he successfully ran for the Senate where he served five terms until 1974 and became the longest serving chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. 
In 1955, Fulbright said that three factors inspired his proposal to establish the exchange program that came to bear his name. He called my experience as a Rhodes Scholar the dominant influence in the creation of the Fulbright Awards, but he added two others, starting with the devastation of the Second World War. Fulbright immediately recognized the implications of the nuclear age for international politics and later referred to the atomic bombings in Japan as the immediate cause of my sponsorship of the legislation to set up an exchange program. Finally, Fulbright mentioned the existence of large, uncollectible foreign credits, windfall income that the United States was accruing overseas in non-convertible currencies from the sale of wartime surpluses. The U.S. government had billions of dollars of wartime material stockpiled overseas in former theaters of war in Europe, Asia, and the Pacific. Building material, fuel, vehicles, medicine, food. These assets, which the historian Sam Lebovich has called war junk, were complicated and expensive to maintain. Foreign governments did not have the U.S. dollars to buy them, so the U.S. government decided to accept non-convertible foreign currencies as payment in order to sell them. On September 27, 1945, just weeks after World War II ended, Fulbright rose in the Senate and proposed a bill authorizing the use of credits established through the sale of surplus properties abroad for the promotion of international goodwill through the exchanges of students in the fields of education, culture, and science. Fulbright initially introduced his bill without consulting the State Department. It was his idea and a congressional initiative. Fulbright's bill was based on a simple but ingenious idea, amending a piece of legislation that had nothing to do with education or exchanges in order to finance educational exchanges. This was the Surplus Property Act of 1944. The purpose of the Surplus Property Act was to help the U.S. transition from a wartime to a peacetime economy by selling off wartime surpluses at home and abroad and this created windfall revenues in non-convertible foreign currencies overseas that Fulbright identified as a means of funding educational exchange. Fulbright's inspired idea was to earmark some of these monies for exchanges, and they were there for the taking. Years later, Fulbright said, the educational exchange program was not born of one of those great debates on which the United States Senate prides itself. It was little understood at the time. And he recognized that his bill was a potentially controversial idea. Therefore, he quietly moved it through Congress with a number of amendments. And President Truman signed the legislation that was to become known as the Fulbright Act into law on August 1, 1946. This is the Fulbright Act in its entirety. It is less than two pages long and highly technical. And it has an almost incomprehensible title an act to amend the Surplus Property Act of 1944 to designate the State Department as the disposal agency for surplus property outside of the continental United States, its territories, and for other purposes. One of its so-called other purposes was to establish the exchange program Fulbright initially had proposed in September 1945. The Fulbright Act established the institutional architecture of the Fulbright program with its many moving parts, by doing five things that can be illustrated using this organogram. The Fulbright Act opens with a long technical passage, establishing a role of the State Department as the sole agency for the disposal of surplus property overseas. The second part of the Act outlines the entire architecture of the program in one long run-on sentence that authorized the Secretary of State to conclude executive agreements with foreign governments that had purchased wartime surpluses and establish unique binational commissions with equal numbers of U.S. and partner country board members for local governance and management. And these commissions, in turn, hired local staff to run the program on the ground. With the revenues these commissions had at their disposal, they provided travel grants for outgoing students, teachers, and scholars to get them to their ports of entry in the United States and comprehensive grants for incoming U.S. grantees to cover their travel and living costs abroad. The program was based on the idea of binational governance and bilateral exchange. 
Transatlantic and transpacific travel for civilians was rare and prohibitively expensive in the 40s and the 50s, and most grantees traveled by ocean liner in the olden days. Fifth, a technical passage at the end of the Fulbright Act authorized the U.S. President to appoint a board of foreign scholarships, the BFS, consisting of 10 members composed of representatives of cultural, educational, student, and war veteran groups. This representative cross-section of leading academics, university leaders, and experts were, as private citizens, responsible for establishing Fulbright program policies and governing the program. The State Department's Office for Exchanges, the forerunner of today's Bureau for Educational and Cultural Affairs, supported the BFS, which designated a number of well-established nonprofit educational and professional organizations, the so-called cooperating agencies, to administer the program in the U.S. They recruited American candidates for grants and helped orient and place grantees from abroad at American host institutions. The Fulbright program was based on reciprocal exchanges as mirror-reversed incoming and outgoing processes. Fulbright, who amended his bill to provide for an independent BFS, later circumscribed its creation as a first step in insulating the program from current political interests. Oscar Hanlon, the Pulitzer Prize-winning Harvard historian and chair of the BFS in the 60s, was more explicit. He called the BFS a unique governmental institution consisting of private citizens whose primary affiliations are academic and the product of an intention to keep the program free of either political or bureaucratic interference based on a commitment to the traditional conceptions of academic freedom. The Fulbright program was conceived as a highly non-governmental governmental program, and this characteristic contributed to establishing its reputation and promoting its acceptance overseas. For example, eight of the ten members of the Board of Foreign Scholarships were well-known private educators, not government employees. The so-called cooperating agencies responsible for program support in the United States were reputable private, nonprofit, and professional educational organizations. And the binational commissions abroad, with their binational boards, were not instruments of either government, but operated independently in the mutual interest of both. However, despite the ingenuity of the Fulbright Act, it had some major shortcomings. It only provided for funding in foreign currencies accrued through the sale of wartime surpluses overseas, which could cover all of the costs of comprehensive grants for U.S. grantees overseas, but only the travel costs of grantees from abroad to their points of entry in the United States. Due to the absence of U.S. dollar funding, there were no funds to cover the costs of the administration of the program in the United States or to provide for other expenses incurred by grantees from overseas in the U.S. Between 1947 and 1952, 28 countries and former theaters of war in Europe, Asia, and the Pacific established binational Fulbright commissions. But the program was limited to these countries with wartime surpluses. In these countries, the revenues from the sale of these surpluses were limited too and bound to be depleted. Fortunately, earmarking revenues from the sale of agricultural purchases overseas in 1954 extended the logic and the reach of the program, and 15 new agreements were signed between 1954 and 1960, with eight in Latin America. Two factors were decisive in offsetting these initial shortcomings in getting the Fulbright program off the ground. First, the BFS solicited support from the diverse institutions of American civil society, and they collaborated to put comprehensive packages of cash and in-kind support together for incoming Fulbright grantees. Second, Congress passed the United States Information and Educational Exchange Act, better known as the Smith-Munt Act, in January 1948, 18 months after the Fulbright Act. Smith-Munt provided funding for the continuation and reorganization of U.S. propaganda and information programs after World War II, an information service to promote a better understanding of the United States and other countries by disseminating information about the United States abroad, and it established an educational exchange service to increase mutual understanding between the people of the United States and other countries and to cooperate with other nations. 
This provided urgently needed funding in U.S. dollars for the Fulbright program, as well as for the establishment of other U.S. government exchange programs in the future. Once the component parts of the original mixed funding formula for the Fulbright program fell into place, the program was a resounding success. It consisted of foreign currencies for expenses overseas, U.S. dollars from Smith Month for U.S. dollar expenses in the States, and various forms of private cash and in-kind support for grantees from abroad in the United States. From 1945 until the establishment of the United States Information Agency in 1953, there also was an ongoing debate on how to best organize and administer peacetime propaganda information and exchange programs, activities funded by Smith Munt. At the end of August 1945, five fundamentally different but complementary functional activities were incorporated into the Office of International Information and Cultural Affairs that, in turn, operated in five geographical policy regions. This office inherited the propaganda activities of the defunct Office of Wartime Information, the so-called fast media of print, radio, and film, along with the so-called slow media, such as libraries and the fledgling exchange of persons programs. In 1952 and 1953, Senator Fulbright and his Republican colleague from Iowa, Burke Hickenlooper, alternately chaired a special Senate subcommittee tasked to comprehensively evaluate the organization and the effectiveness of the United States overseas information programs. They heard the testimonies of hundreds of practitioners and experts and collected thousands of pages of testimony. The advocates of exchange programs argued that there were fundamental differences between the long-term objectives of promoting international understanding through educational and cultural exchange programs based on the principles of bilateral dialogue, reciprocity, and the freedom of expression, and the short-term day-to-day policy-driven unilateral messaging of information programs designed to inform, educate, and persuade foreign audiences in the American national interest. The arguments for organizationally segregating exchanges from information ultimately carried the day. When the United States Information Agency was established as an executive agency in 1953 to manage overseas print, radio broadcasting, film, and libraries, exchanges were not included in its portfolio. The State Department retained the management of international exchange programs in a small office called the Bureau of International Cultural Relations, the forerunner of today's ECA. This put the final touches on the original architecture of the Fulbright program. Once everything had fallen into place, the Fulbright program boomed in the 1950s. By 1961, 41 countries with binational Fulbright commissions were participating in the program, which had over 50,000 alumni. On August 1, 1961, the 15th anniversary of the signature of the Fulbright Act to the day, President Kennedy invited Fulbright and the other politicians who had been instrumental in establishing the program to the White House for a commemoration. He noted that this program has been one of the great acts of creative and constructive statesmanship in the post-war period, Fulbright grants are known throughout the world for the ceaseless, informal, and effective work they do for better world understanding and for developing the talents of individuals. And he added, thanks to your leadership, Congress is presently considering new legislation which would consolidate and strengthen various existing legislation and thereby establish a firm basis for moving forward in the 60s. The purpose of this new legislation was to consolidate the Fulbright Act of 1946 and the smith munt Act of 1948 into one new and more expansive piece of exchange legislation, the Mutual Educational and Cultural Exchange Act of 1961, better known as the Fulbright-Hayes Act, which Kennedy signed into law on September 21, 1961. The Fulbright-Hayes Act relied on the established strengths of the program by providing for the creation or continuation of binational or multinational educational and cultural foundations and commissions. It also invited foreign governments, international organizations, and private individuals, firms, associations, and agencies to participate in co-funding the program in the future. 
The institutionalization of binational cost sharing ingeniously provided new sources of revenue in foreign currencies for the Fulbright program in countries with binational commissions. It effectively replaced the program's reliance on the revenues from the sale of U.S. wartime or other surpluses overseas by introducing cash and in-kind contributions coming directly from partner country governments as a new source of foreign revenue. Furthermore, the Fulbright-Hayes Act provided for increased funding for exchanges as a line item in the U.S. budget, which allowed the State Department to extend the program to countries which had not concluded executive agreements to establish binational commissions. This introduced a new and different category of awards and gave the program a global reach. This new category of Fulbright grant relied on the existing stateside structures of the program for administrative support. And these grants were unilaterally funded and managed as part of a U.S. government program by U.S. embassies without the Fulbright program's trademark bilateral agreements by national commissions or co-funding opportunities. The five years following the signature of the Fulbright-Hayes Act were a period of optimism, increased funding, and dynamic growth. They established co-funding by partner governments as a new and important feature of the program, led to the conclusion of nine new executive agreements, including three in Africa and one with communist Yugoslavia, and extended the reach of the program globally. The first major crisis in the program's history coincided with its all-time funding peak in the mid-1960s. Fulbright's principled opposition to the United States' escalation of the Vietnam War ruptured his relationship with President Johnson, a long-standing personal friend and political ally. Increased spending on the war put tremendous strain on the discretionary funding of the federal budget, and John Rooney, the powerful chair of the House Committee on Appropriations and a hawk on Vietnam, was skeptical about exchanges. These downside factors combined contributed to dramatic cuts in funding, totaling over 40 percent between 1966 and 69, and resulting in a 30 percent drop in the number of grants awarded. Then funding stagnated at low levels during the Nixon administrations in the 1970s. 1978 also was a milestone in the administration of the Fulbright program. A reorganization of USIA then briefly called the International Communications Agency, entailed moving exchanges out of the State Department in with the other programs in the agency's information portfolio. And this putatively made Fulbright a USIA program. After the cuts of the late 60s and the stagnation of the 70s, funding for public diplomacy and exchanges picked up in the 80s under the Reagan administrations during the so-called Second Cold War. After the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union between 1989 and 1991, funding for public diplomacy peaked in 1994. In between 1990 and 1997, 10 new binational Fulbright commissions came into being, with six of them in the so-called new democracies in what had been called communist Eastern Europe. Ironically, a few years after the Berlin Wall fell, funding for USIN exchanges fell too, canceling many of the gains of the 1980s in real terms. Policymakers thought that USIA had served its purpose. It was downsized in the mid-90s, then in 1999, broken up into its constituent parts. ECA and exchange programs were consolidated with the State Department. 9-11 and the advent of the global war on terror precipitated a renewed run-up in funding for exchanges, most of which flowed into embassy-based programs or into programming in the Muslim world between Morocco and the Philippines. For a retrospect on the funding history of the program, you have to look at the yellow bars on this graph from the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board's 2014 annual report, because they are in so-called constant dollars that show real dollar values in inflation-adjusted terms. U.S. government funding for Fulbright has been a roller coaster ride, with an absolute peak in 1966, followed by drastic cuts and stagnation in the 60s and 70s, a funding run-up in the 80s and early 90s, renewed cuts in 1996, then another run-up after 9-11. 
Funding for Fulbright Awards is lower today in real dollars than it was over 55 years ago in 1966, when there were fewer Fulbright programs in fewer countries. And it has been stretched to fund 49 binational commissions and over 100 embassy-based programs today. A look at the distribution of grantees between countries where the program is managed by Fulbright commissions and countries where it is managed by U.S. embassies illustrates some interesting trends since the late 70s too. Funding and grantee numbers were stagnating at low levels in the late 70s when USAA started administering the Fulbright program. Since then, cumulative funding and grantee numbers have undulated upward. In USIA and then the State Department have committed increasing amounts of funding to unilaterally managed embassy-based Fulbright programs in specific policy regions. However, countries with binational commissions dating back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, and early 90s still form the philosophical and organizational foundation of the program. Over 78% of the program's alumni receive grants from binational Fulbright commissions. And since the Fulbright-Hayes Act of 1961, contributions from partner governments have increased steadily from zero to an average of about $100 million annually in recent years. More than 90% of the support from overseas comes from countries with binational commissions, many of which commit more funds annually to the program than the U.S. appropriation. Looking back on the grand scheme of things, binational commissions were part of the foundational ingenuity of the Fulbright Act 75 years ago, and they have been an important source of stability, growth, innovation, and resilience for the program ever since. Looking back at the history of the Fulbright program after 75 years from the vantage point of 2021, I think that one can still readily endorse President Kennedy's evaluation of the import and impact of the Fulbright program. Of all of the examples in recent history of beating swords into plowshares, of having some benefit come to humanity out of the destruction of war, I think that this program in its results will be among the most preeminent. Thank you so much, Lonnie. That was a wonderful historical summary. Um, and I have to make a correction. I can't read my notes. And I believe I said 17 years after uh, Fulbright program started, I did my Fulbright. Actually, I'm not that old. It was 47 years afterwards. <laughs> now, Terry will talk about the present program. Terry? Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. It is an honor to be a part of this panel. My topic is broad. Fulbright today, challenges and opportunities. And I have a dazzling 12 minutes to address all of that. So what I'll do is I will limit myself to four observations that I will make through the lens of an independent binational Fulbright Commission and offer them as conversation starters. An overarching argument that carries through my four points is that challenges and opportunities should not be viewed as separate. We should strive to find opportunities in the current challenges or ways to turn the challenges into opportunities. In other words, for me, challenges are opportunities. As my first observation, I wanna underline the sheer complexity of the global program. It's a notion that may seem self-evident, but the significance of it and its implications are often underestimated and not properly understood. Fulbright is a remarkable international exchange program with a global reach. It's highly complex with a vast number of stakeholders, cooperating agencies and networks, all participating in carrying out the program. In practice, this complexity can sometimes be a real challenge. The participating countries are obviously very different from each other. And there's a difference between the well over 100 programs run by US embassies 
and the 49 programs run by binational actors, the commissions. But further, if you compare the 49 binational programs, there are vast differences among them too, including what specific grants are available, how they're managed, and who funds them, among others. To complement the chart that we saw in the previous presentation with the US government angle on the structure of the program, I wanted to share with you a chart from another perspective. Here, just as a case study, is what the program looks like from where I stand. It's a commission-run program. And note that this is a highly simplified chart of the complex reality. The program is binational, so you have the two equal sides in the slide. It is based on a governmental agreement, so you have the two governmental structures behind the program on both sides. You also see some of the key institutions on both sides that help make the program happen in practice. In short, it's a complex set of relationships, all of which have to function seamlessly for the program to function well. The quality of these relationships ultimately determines the outcome. It is important to note that in the case of another commission in another country, their chart looks different. The commissions are all unique. For instance, characteristic to our Finnis case is that the vast majority of our grants for both Finns and Americans are funded by Finnish institutions. So you see the big blue box there denoting the large number of our institutional partnership agreements. Another fundamental element in our case is the strategic engagement of the alumni. The grant experience is a gateway to lifelong engagement and impact, and both our Finnish and American alumni are involved in every aspect of our work, including funding grants. Hence, the entire chart rests on the block that says alumni. Regardless of the differences, the one thing that applies to all Fulbright programs in all countries is that to be successful, all of them rely heavily on relationships. So in view of the administration of the program in the US and beyond, my action point is, the better all of us learn to understand how things work and how they look from the perspectives of others, and the better we take care of these relationships, the higher the probability of a successful collaboration and the better the program. My second observation is about the changing operational environment. Fulbright is part of the global international higher education and exchange East terrain and operates within the constantly evolving environment. There are three major interconnected trends or areas affecting international exchanges overall. They are digitalization, globalization, and sustainability. The question is, how will Fulbright proactively ride these trends in a way that adequately manages their many challenges yet at the same time mines their opportunities. Digitalization and new technologies continue to transform our operational environment and our work. There is so much one could and should say about this, but in this brief time slot, I will limit myself to one point only. I argue that those who are going to be successful in international education and exchanges in the future are the ones who master the hybrid. Face-to-face -face immersive experiences continue to be at the very core of Fulbright exchanges. But the new digital and hybrid possibilities are a real opportunity to create significant additional value, to add to and to enhance the traditional programs and activities and to help extend the experience and connections. I also think they offer significant potential to expand access and equity. While equally much could be said about globalization as well, let me here too offer one comment only. With the new and widespread video conferencing technologies, we are no longer bound to place and time zones. We easily gather our grantees together with our stakeholders and alumni from multiple decades across several continents and time zones. Our foundations, operations, and alumni and stakeholder engagement have in practice in many ways already become global. For us, this borderless thinking also refers to the need for critical action on inclusivity and ensuring that the program participants really reflect the diversity of the populations of the participating countries and communities. Here too, the new technologies on their part can provide some help for us to create the change we need. 
Out of the three major areas, I find sustainability the most critical because it includes such fundamental concerns. The sustainability of Fulbright as a program overall, ability to adapt and renew itself in the constantly changing operational environment is going to be critical. The sustainability of the long-term funding of the program and the viability of the resources is another key question and a constant topic of discussion and of concern. Going forward, what will be the developments in the country-specific allocations from the US and from partner governments? And what are the realistic opportunities of all of the country-specific programs to obtain other funding? Sustainability also refers to the environmental and societal sustainability and the discussion about mobility and its environmental impact. What does Green Fulbright look like? Sustainability is addressed by dedicated grants. The Fulbright Finland Foundation, for instance, has a strategic grant titled Seeking Solutions for Global Challenges, broadly aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals to support research and teaching specifically on topics of global importance. But the concern is not only about topics of research. What are the ways in which mobility itself can be mindful about sustainability? In view of how we all arrange the administration and management of mobility programs, I think we need to walk the talk too. My third observation concerns the lessons taught by the pandemic. Despite all its serious and tragic consequences, for our field, the COVID-19 pandemic has offered one silver lining. A crisis is both a test and a learning opportunity. It challenges your organization, reveals what works and what doesn't. The pandemic crisis and its implications on Fulbright played out very differently in different countries. The learning outcomes have been very different too. But the key is to pause, to take an honest look in the mirror, to analyze, and then use that to pivot. In our own foundation's case, the whole color chart that you saw on the earlier slide was put to the test. And among the most important takeaways was the value of our partnerships. The pandemic illuminated their immense importance, the quality, functionality, mutuality, and the trust in these relationships on the ground, where what helped us respond to and navigate the crisis. Without that, the outcome would have been remarkably different. The pandemic showed us that there is enormous strength in the Fulbright program's original ideals of mutuality and genuine partnerships. The fourth and final observation I wanna make is about the program's multiple and evolving roles. An ongoing conversation about Fulbright throughout its history, as well as today, is the role of the program. And a broad range of terms and concepts are used in this discussion. In our orientations for both Finnish and American grantees, we talk about the overlapping and complementary roles that grantees may have. For instance, citizen diplomacy and education diplomacy. And many of our scholars work in areas and projects that have characteristics of science diplomacy or knowledge diplomacy, just to mention a few examples. And it's good to remember that there is quite a bit of variation in the definitions of these terms too. I think it's important to acknowledge that the role of the program is not identical in all participating countries globally. Instead, its role, scope, and emphasis can be distinctly different across countries, contingent upon the governmental agreement and jointly identified priorities in the given binational context. So each bilateral program operates in a somewhat open and negotiable academic space defined by one or typically several of these multiple roles. With 20 years as a Fulbright director, it would be very difficult for me to choose one single term that could describe the program and its role in full. But if I absolutely had to pick only one, the closest would probably be a leadership program. I would like to see Fulbright as an inclusive leadership network where the word leadership is not about age, rank, achievements, or titles, but rather a choice that anyone can make to lead by taking responsibility and working in collaboration to create positive change. 
When the Fulbright program was founded, it was a trailblazer. Trailblazing going into the future requires leadership, embracing constant change, finding opportunities and challenges, and drawing strength from the program's original ideals of partnership and mutuality. The best way to celebrate the past is to come together to build the future. It is up to all of us to work together to ensure that Fulbright is also a trailblazer into the future. So to everyone in Fulbright, in any of the many roles in its complex network, past or present, congratulations on the 75th. Kiitos. Thank you. Terry, thank you so much for identifying and focusing on some present day trends and issues that we have with the program. And I'm sure that you initiated a lot of questions. Now Jay will give us some glimpses into what the future may hold for the Fulbright program. Jay? Thank you, Cynthia. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. And it's an honor uh, to be um, with you today and to celebrate uh, this uh, remarkable program. And um, to follow in Lonnie's uh, presentation, also Terry's presentation, um, as you can see, the past, present, and the future, they are also very much interconnected, uh, interwoven. And uh, Terry has already outlined uh, quite a number of uh, uh, trends and, and the things that we are looking into the future based on uh, the original ideals of this program. And uh, so what I'll do is um, I'll talk about uh, the public diplomacy context uh, in which uh, this program uh, has been viewed and what does that mean uh, into the future as public diplomacy as a field of practice and also field of study uh, is uh, undergoing uh, changes just as uh, uh, other fields. And, um, um, and, and I'll um, identify a couple of things uh, to help us to think through in fact, some of the specific issues in, uh, Terry has already out outlined. Uh, let me uh, pull, back, uh, pull up my uh, notes here. <clears throat> so, hold on. Okay. Um, so very quickly, uh, public diplomacy, uh, as we all know, originally uh, refers to a nation's effort to inform and influence uh, foreign publics through a variety of open communications platforms and programs, and including uh, international exchange. Uh, but nowadays, uh, this field has expanded uh, that integrates diplomatic, uh, corporate, and social interests. As we all know, the field of international relations as such, uh, it's no longer just about uh, governmental actors uh, in the international kind of a um, uh, 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 the, the international uh, interaction uh, uh, interactive uh, system uh, that involves uh, many non-state actors of global uh, uh, global consequence uh, in the in the in the global system, and also uh, the original conception of. Um, you know, public diplomacy as a communication engagement with foreign publics uh, is in need of uh, revising and rethinking because, uh, because these days it's very hard for us to separate uh, what is domestic and what is international. And so it increasingly uh, implies the requirements of engagement with not just the foreign publics, but also domestic, but also we have a lot of in between publics, uh, diaspora publics. Um, so the field itself is taking on multiple uh, uh, characteristics involving uh, the different disciplines, uh, different methodologies and conceptual tools. And uh, so at the broadest level, we are looking at this as something at the intersection of communication and global affairs. So as we see it as a more communication centric activity, um, as was pointed out earlier, um, no, digital technology certainly is transforming um, our lives and certainly also uh, international exchange uh, uh, programs. It provides a capacity for public diplomacy in general to expand, but at the same time, as we all 
you know, experience this uh, the evolving information ecosystem. Uh, it's certainly exacerbating uh, social distrust and social division. And the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified lots of tensions and uncertainties in the global arena. And I just uh, use a quote uh, from the latest National Intelligence Council's Global Trends 2040 report, uh, which says the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic marks the most significant singular global disruption since World War II with health, economic, political, and security implications that will ripple for years to come. So with all these changes, what remains the same? So public diplomacy uh, remains uh, as endeavor to create and maintain relationships with stakeholders across political, economic, and social dimensions for us to advance international policy and international action. The functionalities, of course, uh, have broadened and so has its constituency, as I was talking about a minute ago. And then the way, the way, and then the, way the impact, uh, you know, how we look at the impact of public diplomacy uh, pretty much still comes down to the extent to which how the opinion environment, uh, which public diplomacy um, navigates and manages, uh, uh, how that opinion environment broadens or limits policy, uh, policy options and policy, uh, policy actions. Uh, because as we look at public diplomacy programs in terms of the output and the uh, outcomes, uh, we look at you know, whether uh, the favorable perceptions of attitudes uh, towards a certain country, a certain issue. Uh, so those uh, are very much still with us, uh, but we're also looking at uh, to what extent um, you know, knowledge about uh, certain uh, countries and societies have increased or uh, whether relationships are established. Increasingly, we are moving towards uh, from a more information-based type of um, uh, assessment to a more relational base. So looking at relationship as really the, uh, uh, the, the major outcome uh, of, of public diplomacy uh, activities. So we are currently, um, and going forward uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the near future, uh, it's gonna be a, a volatile, and I also use the word competitive, doesn't uh, uh, mean that it is kind of zero sum com competition but it is a competitive uh, environment. Uh, first of all, the field of international exchange is becoming more quote unquote competitive because we are seeing steady increase of programs and offerings in this space from major powers, but also from middle power countries. So there are many offerings and it, it could be a very great thing, a great thing that for many more people uh, to be able to um, uh, experience uh, the international exchange, the cultural exchange, um, at the same time, uh, the information environment, as I mentioned earlier, it's also very competitive because the tools, how we engage uh, with our key stakeholders, uh, with our alumni, uh, for instance, or with uh, uh, our pros uh, prospective uh, participants in our program, uh, 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 the, the communications landscape, it's, uh, it's very competitive uh, because of the attention, so-called attention economy, uh, as a result of the information abundance. And uh, also, we also see uh, growing cultural mobility. Uh, we see people move around, you know, ideas move around, um, but these cultural contacts, of course, can be uh, harmonious mixing and minglings and which all, we all kind of uh, uh, aspire, uh, you know, these contacts to be, but it also uh, can be uh, very contentious and uh, provoke our basic impulses of prejudice uh, which says that uh, these cultural contacts become negative contacts, negative contact situations, as we are seeing uh, uh, more and more uh, as a result of uh, the mobility of people, of goods, of information. Now, growing social, we're also seeing growing social division and polarization and facilitated by social media, but not just social media, other media platforms against this, uh, you know, uh, the backdrop of broad-based discontent among segments of our public as a result of changing economic structure and expanding cultural mobility um, as, um, as we are seeing. So what does that all this mean uh, to Fulbright as 75? And what does that mean more in general to international exchange? Um, I, I just offer uh, two um, uh, thoughts and then just uh, two observations, basically not, uh, yeah, just to kind of, uh, to help us to get uh, the discussion started. Uh, one, as I 
already kind of uh, um, uh, mentioned. And going forward, uh, how we see uh, international exchange and programs like Fulbright uh, more as a global network. I think Terry already has you know, discussed and basically is practicing that. And it's uh, the question is, how do we, you know, uh, how do we invest the tools and the capabilities and to uh, unlock uh, what the value of uh, such a network. And the other one is, uh, I thought it might be interesting for us to think about Fulbright as a, an iconic global brand. And because I always think about Fulbright in the field of international exchange is the most well-known, the most uh, respected, the preeminent brand uh, that's out there. Uh, as we are entering a space where there are many more, uh, you know, international exchange programs uh, that, be, that, that are being offered. Uh, so uh, above the first point of taking a network perspective, we know that a relationship is always the cornerstone of international exchange. Uh, the difference uh, uh, here is that when we talk about relationships, when we view them as isolated entities, we emphasize one pair of actors and their relationships at a time. And I think that for, uh, the binational commission, you know, uh, aspect of this, uh, it's more about, you know, one pair of countries, right? Uh, you know, interacting and then looking at the relationship once at a time. Certainly uh, that is a starting point. Um, it's the sort of foundational uh, uh, point. Um, however, if we take a network perspective, that represents a more holistic view of looking at multiple pairs of relationships simultaneously and to look at how these relationships influence change and evolution of other relationships. And I kind of, uh, this kind of reflects back to what Terry was saying, you know, about uh, looking at uh, alum, alumni relations and how that influences uh, what policy arena, you know, uh, uh, that uh, we wanted to uh, uh, focus our energy on, right? So. Uh, so, so this is a taking uh, a relationship, kind of a network perspective of the relationships that we have uh, within the global uh, network of the Fulbright program uh, to the, uh, uh, the next level. Now, taking a network perspective of relationships assumes that networks are valuable, networks have value, and they are, they are potential assets for cooperation and partnership to tackle shared challenges. But to build and sustain these networks, we need to understand their structure and performance and invest more time in the tools and capabilities. So the Center on Public Diplomacy, which I direct, and we've been looking into this. Uh, so how do we apply a network perspective to get a sense of uh, you know, mapping out the structure of such a network of international exchange and, and what is the value and what is the performance? Uh, it is still at a very early stage of uh, these type of uh, uh, research and discussion. I just saw, for instance, give you just a quick example. You know, as we look at the study tour uh, as an international exchange program, when we bring international participants to, a, to, a, to another country uh, where they actually form relationships. So they form relationships uh, with, uh, you know, their counterparts in the host countries, but they also form relationships with themselves, the, 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 you know, the, the peer participants in the same program. So they form relation in-country networks during a post program and in a very uh, in organic way. And so we looked into what types of uh, networks actually uh, were formed as a result of uh, the participation in this particular international exchange program. So it could be any, anything like it's a discussion network, it's a function advice seeking, it could be new connections network. So. So there's a there's a there's a there's a host of uh, functionalities uh, that are coming out of uh, these uh, whether it's formal network or informal networks uh, that will provide us some sense of what might be the structure and what kind of performance uh, these networks uh, currently have. And I certainly think that uh, uh, you know a Fulbright program globally, but also regionally, uh, in various ways that uh, uh, there are um, there are ways for us to capture uh, what kind of network value. Uh, that we have uh, for uh, the uh, the program, and so all of this suggests points to that we are looking at exchanges as open ended. Uh, so open ended, and not just from the programmatic perspective. Open ended. I hope that it also translates into uh, the the commitment of investing. You are not just investing uh, in the six month uh, exchange period. It's supposed to be an open ended. This exchange not just six months. It's an open end. It's a more open ended engagement. 
uh, the, so uh, the other observation that I have is uh, how do we, if we look at this through the lens of Fulbright as an iconic brand. So as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, uh, we are seeing a proliferation of, I call it micro program brands because they're just not as big as Fulbright and some of the other uh, like IBLP, you know, very well known um, uh, with a long uh, programs with long history. And we have a lot of uh, upstarts. Uh, so alongside uh, these very established uh, brands, quote unquote brands such as Fulbright in, in the field, um, so going forward in order to maintain the presence and impact in a more crowded field, but a much broadened space, I do believe it is instructive for us to consider, you know, these diff uh, three core aspects of activities. If we look at this from sort of the branding perspective, it's like, how do we define uh, sort of the identity uh, of, uh, if, if we think of Fulbright as a brand, uh, the, uh, the brand, and how do we engage and how we actually manage? It's just another sort of a angle and lens. We look at some of the similar uh, challenges and opportunities that are outlined by the previous two speakers. So uh, as an iconic brand, Fulbright becomes a shorthand for important ideas and values, especially in times of uncertainty. Uh, but my question is, what, what are those important values and ideas does Fulbright stand for? Uh, it may stand for different countries, uh, different uh, regions may have, uh, you know, uh, uh, different, uh, uh, the program stands for uh, different ideas and values. Um, so uh, in times of uncertainty, as we are experiencing, trust is critical. And the people often look up to uh, these more established, you know, kind of a trusted uh, brands and entities. And hence that, I do think that, um, um, you know, as a well-established, uh, uh, program. Uh, it gives a sense, if we look through the sort of the branding lens, uh, it gives us a sense of both belonging and standing out because we belong to the program, uh, but we also stand out as a preeminent program uh, that's, uh, that's distinct and, uh, and, uh, and it's different from other programs. And it is also, it could also be a relationship partner as an element of social identity. So anyway, so it's about thinking about how do we you know, uh, define uh, the brand identity for Fulbright uh, for the years to come. And how do we engage, uh, how do we communicate its distinction and its relevance and engage uh, key stakeholders through a variety of narrative formats and uh, narrative platforms, uh, including, for instance, greater personalization to enhance experience. Terry already talked about hybrid, so I, 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 uh, I, I didn't actually put hybrid here, uh, but one example it is, I think that, uh, uh, digitization allows us uh, to do greater personalization to enhance uh, program experience. And uh, of course, uh, the most important point, uh, if not uh, you know, uh, equally important as defining the identity, it is about the uh, structure of support, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the funding um, and, and how we structure all these programs. Uh, since this is a, a, a global network it's very diverse and it's also very localized. And uh, uh, so thinking about the structure, the mix of different programs uh, in the global Fulbright network, global Fulbright brand portfolio, and uh, how do we uh, institute strat uh, structure and strategies to protect and promote a brand as a societal asset is critical uh, given the headwinds of polarization. And so, because one of the things uh, we are seeing in public diplomacy uh, uh, as a field as well, it, as I said earlier, that we're not only considering foreign publics, but we're also looking at the domestic publics and, and, and how the domestic and for uh, the communication about foreign policies, uh, international engagement with our domestic uh, public is equally important uh, uh, as we communicate to engage our foreign publics. However, in a very polarized environment, um, uh, it may, uh, you know, backfire uh, on some of the uh, treasured assets that we have, especially in our international exchange space. So anyway, I just kind of uh, throw this out uh, as a way of thinking about uh, how do we manage the program as a brand going forward against all of these uh, different challenges and also opportunities, uh, but in, especially in light of the volatility uh, of the times that we are uh, living in. So thank you, I'll stop here. Looking forward to uh, our discussions.
Cynthia, I think you're on mute. Am I, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good now. Okay, uh, thank you so much because my machine was telling me I was off. Um, but what I was doing is thanking Jay because um, Jay helped us to see how the Fulbright brand can be defined or maybe even redefined in a future environment that I think you described as more volatile and competitive. So I, I just thought that that was really interesting. We have loads of questions for all of you all. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna start with the question for you, Lonnie. Um, when you gave us the historical perspective, uh, there appeared to be a tension between uh, an independent academic program and um, a political need to promote American interest. Is there any way to resolve that tension? Well, uh, the good senator from the state of Arkansas uh, uh, kept, the, kept exchanges out of USIA when USIA was established in 1953 because he felt that, we, uh, that they were uh, in principle incompatible with propaganda. He was unhappy when uh, the exchange programs went into the uh, USIA in 1978 and he would be unhappy about uh, about consolidation. Uh, 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 that being said, he, he felt that they were, uh, they were fundamentally uh, different uh, activities. Uh, in many respects, complementary. They certainly could serve the American national interest, uh, but you can't program uh, uh, academic exchange if it's based on the academic freedoms of expression, uh, opinion, and inquiry. Yeah, you can't you can't program those outcomes. You have to allow individuals to en enter into those uh, conversations and dialogues with each other uh, in a spirit of, uh, of openness. So he would, he would make a great distinction between uh, the, unidirec the unidirectional nature of a lot of uh, information, uh, educating, informing, influencing foreign audiences, and letting people find out themselves and build their own relationships. Thank you, Lonnie. I appreciate that. Um, Terry, you raised the issue of inclusivity. And here's a question that builds on that. Um, how do you think technology is assisting Fulbright outreach to all international communities, including those with disabilities? I think it will be tremendously helpful, um, first of all, to get the word out about the program and also offer opportunities to participate in activities before even applying for a grant. Um, and then extending the sphere that way. Uh, however, I think it's, there is a simultaneous uh, challenge um, because then the digitalization has to take into account um, the, the special needs in, in, in um, uh, in terms of disabilities. So we have to make sure that the, the tools that we use are inclusive. Thank you, Terry. Um, Jay, you talked about um, the brand, the Fulbright brand, and people are really interested in how, do, how does Fulbright um, really make its brand stand out? What is it that is part of our brand that will see us through in the future? Yeah, a great question that I've, I've always been curious about. What if we do, if we uh, conducted a valuation of Fulbright, the program, like, like how we evaluate, how we evaluate a brand. We've done this uh, for nonprofits. Habitat for Humanity is a great example. So, so there's a way we can assess its brand value. And I'm always curious because we, we would, I don't think anybody has done anything in the, for, in the biggest space of the public diplomacy you know, from that perspective. But I do think that, you know, as I was saying that, if you think about international exchange, uh, Fulbright uh, is, the, is the most well-known, 
it's probably most trusted. Um, and, uh, uh, but the interesting question is, uh, what actually has contributed uh, to uh, these, um, the positive, uh, so the brand, if, we were, if you would, uh, engagement and the brand loyalty in many ways, right? Um, so uh, I do think that, um, uh, you know, this lens uh, uh, maybe is uh, valuable uh, for us to think about in, as, we th uh, as we think about how we define the program and for the future and, and, and think about sort of the engagement tools uh, that we need uh, to, uh, you know, to carry us into the future. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I don't, I, I guess I, I, I didn't answer your question more specifically, like what, what exactly, uh, you know, how, how, how strong is the brand is? And I wish that I, there's a valuation that I could even put a dollar figure to that, <laughs> which, which, <laughs> which they did for Habitat of Humanities. Uh, so there are uh, quite a few nonprofits that have gone through this type of brand valuation exercise. Okay, thank you, Jay, appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna throw this question out to Terry, but Lonnie, feel free to jump in. Um, are all exchanges US and with other individual countries or are there any regional grants or cross commission grants? Thank you for that question, because it gives me the opportunity to bring forward the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, which is, I think it's an absolutely brilliant example of a um, um, program that involves several countries. Uh, this one uh, with the eight Arctic uh, Council member countries. Um, and there are thematic programs like that, uh, that are either regional or, or, or based, based on theme. So I think that's a really, really good example. And it, it has been very successful. And something like that going forward would be really, uh, really beneficial. Also, then there are programs that, that uh, could be um, uh, commission um, initiated and could be regional. They could also be alumni programs. Um, so there are examples like this, but the, the first one that comes to mind is certainly the Food by Arctic Initiative. Thank you, Terry. Do you want to say anything, Lonnie? No, uh, I, I would like to point out, uh, just touching on this point, uh, the structure of the program has been based on bilateral exchanges from the start. And Jay mentioned the potential of multilateralism, uh, which has, uh, has, has, has not been uh, investigated uh, at great length in the in the Fulbright environment, although it is a, a common tool that the European Union has used in all of its uh, programming related to uh, higher education exchanges and research. Terry, um, no, Lonnie, this this follows up on that. And and Terry, if you have something you want to say about it, good too. Um, have there been any examples of embassy-based programs transformed? into binational missions? Uh, the commissions have come in three waves. Uh, the, the first wave was between 1947 and 1952. The second wave was between uh, 56 and 60. Uh, the third wave was in the early 60s and the fourth wave was in the 90s. So uh, many of the countries started as embassy-based programs and uh, got Fulbright Commission somewhere along the way, uh, but not all of the commissions uh, that were established have survived the test of time. So uh, 64 binational agreements have been signed. Uh, there are 41 of them are operative today. For example, the country of Yugoslavia doesn't exist anymore. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the really distinguished uh, commission uh, the, in Cyprus, the uh, U.S. Uh, Cypriotic program uh, uh, turned from a commission into an embassy-based program in 2015. So it really goes both ways. Uh, but the tendency of, the, of USIA and the State Department has actually been to uh, invest in embassy-based programs instead of establish, establish new uh, binational commissions. Terry, do you have anything you want to add? No, that was very comprehensive. I don't have anything to add to that one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, this is a question for all three of you. 
How do we spread the story and increase funding? Anybody can jump in. I answered the last one, Terry. <laughs> I'd be happy to go. Um, um, I go back to my original point of inclusivity. I honestly think that all of the grantees, all of the alumni own this program. And, and if everybody would um, sort of fill their own sphere of influence, um, that would multiply. And, and there are so many ways of um, how grantees and alumni and partners and, and, and stakeholders really can engage. Uh, to ensure that we know um, and, and the audience, uh, the wider public knows uh, the impact of the program. Uh, it's important to talk about it. it it's important to advocate. Uh, and it's important to help the, for example, in the case of uh, the Full by FEMA Foundation, um, our alumni help us establish partnerships um, that fund the program. Um, also uh, creating support networks for the grantees and, and talking about the value, talking about the research, talking about the teaching, the discoveries and all, all the innovations that, that the grantees and alumni make, um, all of that contributes uh, to the, uh, the, the brand of the program, um, the, the awareness of uh, decision makers um, about the program. Uh, so there are multiple ways, ways to do that. And, um, and certainly advocacy on different levels um, is very important. Okay. Uh, yeah, Cynthia, I, uh, a couple of points. One is, uh, also I, I made that point earlier about, uh, I think it will be very helpful for us to um, come up with a, a, an articulation of what this relationship network, uh, uh, what is the scale and scope of all of that? I think we do have it. Uh, you know, we, we talk about the individuals uh, participating in this program and uh, you know uh, becoming uh, leaders uh, in various uh, 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 spaces and and, and the countries and all of that. Uh, but if we look at the relation, because at the end of the day, it's about the relationships people have through this program. And if there's a way we can capture that in a more uh, direct, easily accessible way, and in some ways it is more quantifiable way, uh, I think that will that will uh, that will be very helpful. And the second point I wanted to uh, sort of to make, but also underscore what Act Terry said earlier, it is to talk about uh, to look at this from a leadership perspective. Uh, so uh, so how are we leading in this international exchange space? And uh, so, uh, so this has been a trailblazer program. And so, uh, so what's next? I think with this more forward-looking and forward-leaning uh, thinking, uh, I, I certainly think that uh, uh, it, will, it, will, it will gather uh, interest and support. If it's not just from government, I think from the uh, uh, broader society. Uh, I think the society, I think the, the 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 broader society, the broader community uh, sees the need. Uh, how these uh, international relations, international understanding so fundamental for us to tackle shared challenges. And so hence that, you know, the first slide that I said that public diplomacy now integrates diplomatic corporate social interests, because that's just what's happening. It's not just a diplomatic uh, endeavor, a pr primarily di diplomatic endeavor. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to read a comment. We got a comment from someone who said that there's also the Canada-based Fulbright Carlos Rico grant, uh, which provides an opportunity for US scholars to study issues affecting Canada, Mexico, and the US. So as well as questions, we're getting comments on that. Uh, let, let me ask um, a broader question. Okay, I'm gonna give you all a lot of power. You have the power to change the Fulbright program any way you want to. What would you do? I, I recently retired, so <laughs> uh, I've, I've actually had some, uh, some, some time to think about that. And, uh, you know, actually, what I'd like to do, uh, Cynthia, if, if I may, is I would like to cite, uh, cite the good senator himself. 
uh, because he said uh, in 1976, two years after he had left Congress, one year after the last American troops left Saigon, that he considered being involved with this program the most significant and important activity I have been privileged to engage in, uh, during, uh, in, during my years in the Senate. And he was in the Senate uh, for 30 years, and he said that he remained convinced that educational and cultural exchange offers one of the best means for improving international understanding. And what I would wish uh, is I would wish uh, uh, that there's more advocacy for the program and that people give more to the program. The good center said, whereas we readily spend billions for the military and hundreds of billions for propaganda abroad, it is incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult to get the administration and Congress to invest the few score millions necessary to sustain this activity most important to this country's future and world peace. So if I had the ability to wish for something, uh, I would wish for uh, substantial funding increases, uh, not only by the US government, but by other governments and more contributions from the, uh, from the third parties that are so important. And Terry did such a fine job outlining that uh, in, in her remarks. Uh, just, a, just, just, just briefly, a, a, a few weeks ago, uh, President Biden pointed out to the American people that the United States spent uh, $30 million a day in Afghanistan for 20 years. Uh, the United States is spending $240 million per year on the Fulbright program. So if we can change those ratios, uh, I think it would be a great improvement uh, looking into the future. Thank you. Okay, Cynthia. you all, you all are, are greatly empowered. Cynthia, I will, if I were running this, <laughs> I first would do, as I was saying earlier, I would do evaluation exercise because I want to get to the bottom of this and see what value it has, the, these relationships, what exactly that means. And I would also do one uh, is to uh, source uh, innovative, scalable ideas from the entire network. I think Terry has so many great ideas. And I was like, are these, you know, uh, are these great uh, 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 for your country setting or for you know, the region? And maybe certain ideas are scalable. And and I think that, and I think if I, you know, if I were doing this, uh, I would be looking for these innovation, innovative ideas, uh, scalable ideas. Because what we need is Fulbright. That was a big idea. That was a big idea in 1940s, 50s, 60s, right? And, uh, and we now need uh, some new big ideas built upon that. And I think that is, uh, I think this is a, it's a great moment to think this because I think uh, in a way the pandemic disrupted a lot of things and uh, has forced us uh, to rethink, uh, you know, who we engage and how we engage and especially uh, what digital technology uh, means uh, to all the work uh, that we do. So those are the two things that I would do. Thank you, Jay. Terry, you let have the power. A, let me use a metaphor. Um, um, in, a, in a way, what we've tried to do in, in, in a humble way is to use the, the foundation in Finland as a, like a laboratory mm. of trying to see um, if, if we um, mine from the original ideals of the Fulbright legislation of the partnerships and, and the, the mutuality then if we make this really inclusive and we take everybody in, it doesn't have to be just the grantees and the alumni, but everybody and have everyone own it, like really trying to um, um, make the program inclusive, then what comes out of that? And, and I think the lesson that we've learned that there is that there is so much potential there and, and the, the, sum is so much greater or, or the end result is so much greater than the sum of the parts and that's something that the program proves every day um, and the power of the alumni is absolutely astonishing 
um, and our program could not function if it went for the alumni and all of the volunteers. Um, so what they've also helped do is to multiply um, relatively scarce and, and small resources. But if, if you really wanna um, you know, think big, then I, I'll say the obvious. If you think about how much the program does good with the resources it has now, whether it's in Finland or anywhere else, then if you want more of the good, uh, you need more resources. Mm. Uh, so investing in it and, and investing in what you believe in, that would be the way to go. Uh, Cynthia, can I just oh. add to one thing? Because Ooh, I was Jay. thinking about the Binational Commission because that itself, the idea, that was a scalable idea. So hence we're seeing, you know, the, the, the global growth of the program. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so we need something like that, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, that, that mm -hmm. can take us, uh, not necessarily the size, but I just think that uh, it's the, it, I think that the, the, the brand needs to uh, espouse leadership, embody leadership uh, and for the field in general. And then, which is, I think, uh, so critical uh, as we move forward on these global issues that we need to address. Yeah. We just received a follow-up creative question. It says, um, the responses have been excellent, should the Fulbright community lobby for a bill that was specifically peg Fulbright program funding as a percent of the defense budget? Yeah, uh, yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> uh, the, the Fulbright, Fulbright expenditures are somewhere in the, they're not even rounding errors in the defense budget. So uh, not, not even a rounding error. <laughs> So if we could get above a rounding error, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, but I think that's, uh, that's a, a very ad ad adventuresome uh, uh, proposal. But uh, uh, Jay's the policy guy. He's the expert on this one. <laughs> well, I should defer this to what you just said. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, but yeah. uh, that does not. That does not. And uh, 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 Advocacy, uh, as Terry has pointed out, as Jay has pointed out, is exceptionally important. And if I may, uh, I, the Fulbright Association is involved in advocacy. Yeah. Everybody can be involved in advocacy in the United States. Everybody lives in a congressional district. So you have to learn how to advocate for the program and your constituents actually listen to you. And as a Fulbright alum or a friend of the program, you have something to say. And you can donate to the program too. Advocate, donate, yeah. You can donate to the Finnish Commission. You can donate to the Austrian Commission. You can donate to the Fulbright Association. You can donate to any one of these 49 commissions and uh, that money will be certainly well invested. So narrate, advocate, donate. So that may go right into this question, which is the last question I am going to ask. And that is, um, Fulbrighters have always been called citizen diplomats. And we saw that it was one of the terms in Terry's um, presentation. What does that mean now? And what does that mean in the future? What is it we should do? What should we be doing as citizen diplomats? See, I have the easy job. Well, I, <laughs> I asked the questions. I'm looking at Terry again. <laughs> I'm happy to go first. We have one globe. And all of us have to get along on that globe and also ensure that we preserve that for our children and the next generation. That means that people have to understand each other. They have to understand how they think. And there is enormous power in bringing people together um, in a constructive environment, just like the Fulbright does. So citizen diplomacy is serving in that role, um, everybody in their own, um, the way everybody is. Um, there, there is no one single way of doing that. 
uh, but just being oneself and contribute, contributing to the, 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 the discussion. Um, and it may seem um, as if it we're not um, so impactful if it's just one single individual, uh, but all of the individuals together uh, make masses. And, and I think um, in terms of the inclusive leadership that, that I proposed, uh, one thing there is to simply accept the fact that individuals actually can do much more than what they might think in the beginning. And if they are, the more they are of these individuals, the bigger, the, the bigger impact they make. So citizen diplomacy role is something that all of the full writers and any citizens on this globe um, can create for themselves and they should look like themselves. There is no one single role, uh, but the goal has to be shared and it has to be the one. And it's, it's to uh, be able to manage on this globe um, and make sure that we leave it for our kids better in a better shape than it was when we got here. Thank you, Terry. It's interesting, um, that comes down to something my mother used to always tell me. She said that everyone says somebody ought to do something, but they forget they're somebody. And I think that's what we're talking about here. Um, in fact, you have generated a new slogan, Lonnie, and people are saying, okay, narrate, advocate, donate. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Everybody now sees why I started out by saying we have a stellar panel. They really are. They're full bright stars. And I can't tell you what a privilege and a pleasure it has been to moderate a panel of this caliber. Thank you so much for what you've done, for what you're saying, and what you will be continuing to do and to say. So we all appreciate it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.